Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Rory Dunlop and my colleagues in 39 Essex and I are going to be speaking about remedies for victims of trafficking. I'm going to speak first and I'm going to focus on immigration status, in particular refugee status and humanitarian protection. And then the next three talks are going to be about Human Rights Act claims. Nicola Conn is going to talk about establishing a breach of Article 3. Catherine Barnes is going to talk about establishing a breach of Article 4. Adam Bukra is going to talk about remedies under the Human Rights Act. And although uh, we're scheduled to last an hour and a half, I think we might not last that long. Um, in fact, I'm confident we won't last that long, but we will, I hope, have time for a few questions at the end. You won't, I'm afraid, be able to ask questions orally, but what you can do is submit questions in writing using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so I'm gonna begin with my talk and um, unfortunately my hand looks giant as I do this. Um, I uh, have um, an overview here uh, of the different things that I'm going to be talking about. First of all, I'm going to talk you through what the different forms of immigration status are. Then I'm going to cover why the form of immigration status matters, what difference in practice it makes. And then I'm going to talk about how a victim of trafficking can seek to obtain refugee status, which is the highest form of status. And then I'm going to talk finally about how a victim of trafficking can obtain humanitarian protection, which is the second highest form of status. So what are these uh, different forms of status? Um, I've gone through two of them. Uh, and um, as I said, refugee status is the highest form for reasons that we'll come to. It gives you the most advantages. The second best, as it were, is humanitarian protection. And we'll come to what that is and what that means. Um, and the third is discretionary leave to remain. And that is uh, what typically someone might be given if the Secretary of State accepts that uh, they are a victim of trafficking and they cannot be returned. Um, and uh, as we'll see, that has some disadvantages compared to the higher forms of status. So uh, refugee status. In this slide, I've set out uh, paragraph 334 of the immigration rules, which determines uh, which asylum applicants are to be granted refugee status. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it. I should say that on our website after the talk, uh, all of these slides will be available. So please don't feel the need to take notes. Um, you can carry on baking your banana bread or riding on your exercise bike or whatever you're doing to pass the time in lockdown. Um, uh, I'm going to focus um, on the second element of 334, um, and that is the definition of refugee. As you can see from this, there are other conditions that need to be crossed. You need to be in the United Kingdom. You can't be convicted of judgment. But what I'm going to focus on is the definition of uh, refugee. It's not actually defined in the immigration rules themselves. The immigration rules point you to uh, the 2006 regulations, but the 2006 regulations then point you to the Refugee Convention itself. And so in this next slide, I've included the definition of a refugee under the Convention. And I've underlined and italicized the particularly important words from that definition. You can see that a refugee is someone who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside the country's nationality and unable or un owing such fear, unwilling to avail themselves of protection. Now, those underlined words 
are often referred to as a convention reason. It's not enough uh, to fear persecution on return. That does not make you a refugee. You have to fear persecution for a convention reason. And as we will come to see, it's that convention reason requirement that is often the biggest obstacle for victims of trafficking who want to obtain refugee status. This is the part of the immigration rules which deal with humanitarian protection. And again, I'm not gonna read out all of them. Uh, it is, as you can see from 339C subsection two, something you only come to if you don't succeed in obtaining refugee status. That's because for reasons I'll explain, it's not quite as good as refugee status. Uh, the critical points to note are firstly, you don't need a convention reason for your fear on return to get humanitarian protection. So that hurdle is not there. But do note that you need, in cases that don't involve a risk to life, to demonstrate a real risk of suffering serious harm. And note that serious harm is uh, defined um, in 339CA subsection 3 as torture or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment of a person in the country of return. And uh, as I'll come on to explain, that can create difficulties if what your client fears is uh, trafficking from the country of return to a third country and mistreatment in that third country. But uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, the final uh, form of leave, as I said, is discretionary leave to remain. And as uh, the title suggests, uh, it is a broad discretion that covers a number of different reasons why someone might uh, qualify or be suitable for leave to remain. One example is someone whose removal would breach articles three or eight, but they don't qualify for refugee leave or humanitarian protection. Another example is someone who's been conclusively recognized as a victim of trafficking and there are compelling reasons to justify a grant of leave. An example given is that they're helping police with inquiries or they're pursuing a claim for compensation. There are other circumstances in which you can get such leave. Now, why does it matter? Uh, I've um, summarized six of the many reasons why it matters so much. First, uh, length of leave. Someone granted refugee status or humanitarian protection is given a residence permit for five years, whereas if you get discretionary leave to remain, you only have two and a half years to leave to remain. That also leads to the second uh, bullet point, how long they must wait for an ILR, in other words, indefinite leave to remain or settlement. Someone with refugee status or humanitarian protection can obtain ILR after five years, but by contrast, someone with discretionary leave to remain has to wait 10 years. Thirdly, visas for family members. With refugee status and humanitarian protection, you have a right under the immigration rules to family reunion. So partners and children who've been left behind in the home country can come to the UK with uh, without the onerous conditions that are imposed on, for example, the partners of British citizens. By contrast, those given discretionary leave to remain have to overcome the demanding hurdles under Appendix FM if they are going to obtain visas uh, to join their family members. Fourthly, access to higher education. And this is one of those areas where it is an advantage to have refugee status as opposed to humanitarian protection because those with refugee status are classified as home students for the purposes of higher education courses. And that means they can avoid the expensive international fees which would otherwise apply and get students loans from the moment they're recognized as refugees. By contrast, 
those granted humanitarian protection are not automatically considered homeless students, at least not in England, and they need to have been ordinary resident for three years to qualify as a homeless student. As for those with discretionary leave to remain, they're not eligible for higher education student finance until they have indefinite leave to remain, which, as I've said, can take 10 years. Fifthly, uh, refugee status gives a statutory defense to certain criminal offenses connected to illegal entry and possession of false documents. And finally, refugees obtain a convention travel document, enabling them to travel to signatory countries subject to visa requirements. So, obtaining refugee status. Um, as I said in this slide, there are four conditions that need to be met in order to obtain refugee status. The first is demonstrating a risk on return, and typically in a victim of trafficking case, will be a risk of re-trafficking. The second requirement in cases where the persecution is not by an agent of the state is that there is insufficient state protection. The third requirement is no reasonable possibility of internal relocation to safety. So if there's a country where some parts are safe and other parts are dangerous, you have to be able to show it's not reasonable to expect you to travel to the safe parts. And the final condition is that there is a convention reason for persecution. I'm going to focus on the first and the last of these conditions. The second and the third are really things that are um, very familiar to immigration lawyers and don't turn on things specific to victims of trafficking. So um, the first condition, the first hurdle, a risk of re-trafficking. Paragraph 339K of the immigration rules, which I've quoted here, helps in this regard. It sets out a principle which one might think of as common sense, that effectively past persecution is powerful evidence of future risk. And that general principle has been applied in the context of trafficking. And I've mentioned at the bottom a couple of authorities, one from the upper tribunal and one from the Court of Appeal. Uh, the upper tribunal authority, HD, what was said there was the fact that a woman was previously trafficked is likely to mean that she was then identified by the traffickers as someone disclosing characteristics of vulnerability, such as to give rise to a real risk of being trafficked. Uh, and uh, the point being made there was someone who's been identified in the past uh, as uh, someone to be trafficked is likely to be identified again. Um, the more difficult hurdle is often the last one, the requirements to demonstrate a convention reason. Um, and uh, you'll recall when I showed you the slide with the definition of what a refugee is, it requires uh, there to be a convention reason for persecution. And it gives some explicit examples of what a convention reason might be, like race and religion, but it also gives this catch-all of membership of a particular social group. And that begs the question, what is a particular social group? And on this, the case law is in a state of confusion. If a uh, victim of trafficking fears re-trafficking on return, uh, there will often be a strong argument that they face a risk of re-trafficking on grounds of the fact that they are a victim of trafficking. Their experiences as a victim of trafficking will often make them psychologically vulnerable to further trafficking and more of a target for traffickers who may know them or be able to identify them. But that in itself doesn't win you the case. You need to be able to demonstrate that being a victim of trafficking is a particular social group in the country in question. And so uh, that uh, has given rise to various conflicting case law. The answer to that question is uh, not straightforward. 
Um, the slide that you have in front of you gives the definition of what a particular social group is in the 2006 regulations. But it's not a particularly helpful uh, definition because even on its face, it is an example rather than an exhaustive definition. And I've underlined the words, for example. Uh, and in this example, well, it's very obvious that the people are members of a, a particular social group because they both share an innate characteristic or a common background that cannot be changed. And uh, their group has a distinct identity in the relevant country because it is perceived as being different by the surrounding society. Well, that's fine. Of course, that is a particular social group. But the tricky uh, or trickier question from the case law is what happens if you only satisfy the first half of that? That is to say, what happens if your particular social group do share an innate characteristic or a common background that cannot be changed, but they don't necessarily have a distinct identity in the relevant society, uh, or, or they're not perceived as being different by society in general. And, and it's on that tricky issue that the case law is divided. The first approach in a case uh, called Fauna in the House of Lords was to treat this example you have in Regulation 6 as distinctly unhelpful and to say, actually, it's enough if you're either one or two. And um, they based that approach, the House of Lords, in their obita dicta, I should say uh, obita dicta, not binding, on uh, the definition definition in the UNHCR guidelines. And the definition there of a particular social group is persons who share a common characteristic other than their risk of being persecuted or who are perceived as a group by society. So on this uh, approach, uh, victims of trafficking are a particular social group because they share an innate characteristic or a common background that cannot be changed. They don't have to go on and demonstrate that they have a distinct identity in their home country or are perceived as being different. Unfortunately, that is not the end of the case law because there's a decision of the upper tribunal in SB where they rejected the obita dicta in Fauna and they said that regulation 61D is effectively the paradigm case and you need to demonstrate both an innate characteristic and a sort of societal distinct identity. Um, so what should you do? Um, the first thing you should do is, if, as I've done in cases where I've been working with Duncan Lewis on this, is we've argued that Fauna is right and SB is wrong. Uh, but uh, we recognize that we might not win that argument. It needs probably to get to the Court of Appeal at least before it's decided. So in the meantime, what you need to do is try and obtain country evidence to show that victims of trafficking have a distinct identity in the country of return. And that can push you into some rather odd intellectual positions because um, on the one hand, when discussing sufficiency of protection, you will often want to argue that your client's home country has not done enough has not enacted enough measures to protect victims of trafficking. But on the other hand, when you're discussing a particular social group, you'll often want to rely on the very same measures you've been discounting and say that these measures demonstrate that victims of trafficking have a distinct identity in society. And um, in order to sort of avoid these intellectual contortions, it is also sensible to consider at the outset and in your country evidence you may gather whether there are any other particular social groups that your client may fall into which could be said to be part of their reason why they fear uh, re-trafficking on return so for example because of their gender because they are an unwed mother uh, uh, because they are an adult victim of trafficking as opposed to a child victim of trafficking, because in some countries the protections are only for children, and so on. 
So humanitarian protection. As I said, uh, one of the problems with um, uh, this is that um, your client may fear uh, being trafficked from their country of return to a third country. So for example, I had a client from the Philippines and what she feared was uh, being re-trafficked to one of the Gulf states as uh, she'd been done, sorry, she'd been trafficked in the past to the Gulf states and severely mistreated there. And she really thought that if she ended up back there, she'd have no option but to do the same thing again in order to provide enough money for her family. And uh, the problem we ran into is that in the definition of humanitarian protection, it only counts if you fear inhuman and degrading treatment in the country of return. And um, what we did to try and overcome that problem is uh, we argued that in effect, trafficking is a process and not a single event. And we were able to rely on some dicta from Lord Justice Underhill in the TDT case that I've quoted there at the bottom of the slide. And so what we have argued is that um, in a case like my clients, um, it, the fear of uh, inhuman and degrading treatment is not limited to uh, the Gulf states where she might end up being physically mistreated, but it covers the whole process starting with uh, her in the Philippines being trafficked by agents, feeling unable to do anything else. Uh, and so uh, we, um, in that case, we're trying to argue that uh, she therefore qualified for humanitarian protection. As it happened, the case didn't go ahead for other reasons. So the point is still there to be argued. Um, that's the end of my talk. And um, I am going to, uh, with my enormous hands, um, stop sharing and pass over to Nicola. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's now just the um, interesting moment when I work out how to share my screen, which I think I can do. Uh, there we go. Um, seamless, almost. Yes, there we go. I hope you've got it there. Um, there's no way of knowing because there's nobody in the room with me. I'm all on my own in conference room 11. Um, but I hope, and I'll get a WhatsApp from our marketing team if I've done something really ridiculous. Anyway, good afternoon. Uh, always a pleasure to follow a silk when you're doing a talk like this. Um, you've heard from Rory about the role of trafficking in uh, the assessment of an individual's immigration status. Uh, we're going to move on now to talking about potential Human Rights Act damages claims that can be brought on behalf of victims of trafficking, and specifically the role played by um, Articles 3 and 4 of the European Convention. I'm going to speak very briefly about Article 3. I'm going to try and keep to my 10 minutes. And then I'm going to hand on to Catherine, who's going to talk to you about Article 4. And Adam has got some fascinating insights to share on uh, remedies. So do uh, stay with us. If, if you need a moment to make a cup of tea, it's probably now. Um, so uh, Article 3, um, frequently described in the Strasbourg case law as one of the most fundamental values of democratic society. It prohibits in absolute terms torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. Um, and while it's not uh, defined in the convention per se, the European Court of Human Rights has endorsed in part the definition provided by the UN Convention Against Torture, which is any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purposes as obtaining from him confession, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got, you've got the slide there in front of you. Um, so there are four elements to that, which, which is that it's pain that's inflicted by or at the instigation of a public official or a person acting in an official capacity. Uh, it's severe pain or suffering, whether mental or physical. Um, there is intention behind it. So obviously there can be no um, torture by way of, of negligence. Uh, and there is a purpose. Uh, usually uh, such as intimidating or coercing a, a third person or trying to get information out of them. Um, obviously, Article 3 is not a qualified right. It can't be justified by reference to the behaviour alleged or actual 
of the victim. And, and there's some reference to this in some of the case law about, uh, particularly in, in the context of um, alleged terrorists and whether the uh, alleged behaviour of um, the victim has any significance in whether or not treatment constitutes um, torture. It doesn't. Uh, in terms of um, uh, how, what the distinction between torture and ill treatment is, uh, the difference is one of uh, intensity of the suffering uh, inflicted. Uh, and the key case in that is the 1978 case of Ireland and the UK, which examined the five techniques, so-called, uh, used by the RUC when interrogating uh, people during the Troubles. Um, and this considered, th these five techniques were wall standing, hooding, uh, use of noise, sleep deprivation, and food and, and drink deprivation. Um, and this was considered in that case to, con to constitute um, inhuman or degrading treatment, but not torture. It was inhuman and degrading treatment on the basis that the techniques were um, used to uh, arouse in their victims feelings of fear, anguish and inferiority capable of humiliating and debasing them and possibly breaking their physical or moral resistance. But the court, in contrast to the commission, considered that the five techniques did not amount to torture on the basis that they did not occasion suffering of the particular intensity and cruelty implied by the word torture as so understood. And what's interesting, of course, is, is that that's an old case and, and the case law has progressed since then. So that, for example, in cases such as uh, Salmouni in France, um, uh, treatment by police, which included threatening with a blowtorch, urinating on, on the, uh, the complainant, was considered to constitute torture. Um, and in the same way, the case on what constitutes inhuman or degrading treatment is expanding. So you've got on, on the slide there the case of, of Pretty, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, and there the court found that where treatment humiliates or debases an individual, showing a lack of respect for or diminishing his or her human dignity or arouses feelings of fear, anguish or inferiority capable of breaking an individual's moral and physical resistance. It may be characterized as degrading and also fall within the prohibition of Article 3. And similarly, uh, in cases such as Limbuela, uh, the refusal um, to uh, provide subsistence uh, to an asylum seeker in the terms of the denial of food, of shelter, the most basic necessities of life, was considered to be a, a breach of Article 3. In the case of, of RB, um, uh, on the application of B against the Director of Public Prosecutions, which is a very interesting case, uh, about an allegation of GBH, which was withdrawn, the prosecution uh, decided not to pursue it at trial on the basis that the complainant had um, uh, psychiatric difficulties and they considered that he wouldn't be a plausible witness despite his having provided very clear and co coherent evidence of uh, the attack that he said had taken place. The court in that, fact, that case found that the decision to with, uh, withdraw the prosecution um, could uh, come within, uh, constitute a breach of his Article 3 rights. And similarly, a very recent case, VK and Russia, there's a mistreatment of a four-year-old boy by staff in a nursery school, and that was considered to constitute a, vi a violation of his Article 3 rights. So you can see that the, the remit of, of Article 3 has expanded significantly um, over the years, and arguably it's likely to do so. Um, in terms of... Uh, of its significance in the humanitarian context, of course, it's significant as Rory's been talking about, because for those who are not able to claim refugee status, uh, the ability to qualify for humanitarian protection, uh, the subsidiary protection, is a significant one, because obviously that will give them grounds uh, for remaining in the, in the UK if refugee status is beyond their reach. Uh, and there are three possibilities by which they can come within uh, this definition, which would include torture, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment. Um, but obviously, in order for um, torture to be made out, the test is, is, is very high uh, because an individual would have to demonstrate that they were powerless and always in the control of the perpetrator. Uh, and in circumstances where they could theoretically flee because the door was not, for example, always locked, uh, or where they were permitted to go out on their own, as is often the case, 
um, then obviously that burden would not be discharged. And, and of course, torture also requires um, the involvement of a, a state actor, which again is going to be a difficult one uh, to prove uh, in, the, in the context of human trafficking. But in terms of inhuman or degrading treatment, um, considering the treatment of those who are trafficked in the sex trade, uh, it seems almost inevitable that the test for the for inhuman and degrading treatment will, will be met. Um, in other areas, uh, whether or not the minimum level of security, uh, of severity has been reached, I, I am not aware of any case or which, which decides definitively whether trafficking uh, engages Article 3. And it may be that in the course of this talk, um, several of you are going to send me uh, an authority to that effect. But obviously, it would need to constitute inhuman and degrading treatment that would both be above a, a, the minimum level of severity and significant enough to break down, um, to, to involve the breakdown of physical or moral resistance. Uh, and if you look at the the ECHR um, fact sheet on trafficking, and I'm sure you're all aware that they, they produce all of these, which are hugely helpful in a lot of contexts, but there's no definitive answer there either as to whether trafficking would inevitably constitute a breach of Article 3. But it seems to me that where treatment humiliates or debases an individual, showing a lack of respect for diminishing his or human, her human dignity, which is a pretty test, or leads down to a breaking of the physical or moral resistance, then inevitably Article 3 is going to be engaged. And obviously, in most circumstances of trafficking that, that I can conceive of, uh, it seems that that threshold would be met. But moving on to uh, the, the point of, uh, of bringing a Human Rights Act damages, uh, damages claim, obviously the issue there is what the obligations of the state might be. Uh, and there are two limbs, as they say, in all of these uh, articles, um, the negative obligation and the positive obligation. The negative obligation obviously being that on the state to refrain from inflicting torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. And the positive obligation, which is the systems or systemic duty to establish a set of laws that will protect individuals from torture and the operational duty to investigate alleged instances of ill treatment. Um, and the state's obligation uh, on, under um, the positive obligation is twofold and that's set out in the case of MC in Bulgaria with, uh, with which many of you are probably familiar. It's a case that concerned the rape of an underage girl um, in circumstances where Bulgarian law at the time had no means of prosecuting individuals, where the girl made no allegation of force and, and in that case the court held that the state's positive obligation under Article 3 is twofold. First, to enact criminal law provisions to effectively punish the carrying out of torture in human or degrading treatment. And second, distinct from this, the state has a positive obligation to carry out a proper investigation and prosecution so that the laws can be applied effectively. Um, and the court also, applying the case of um, Calvelli and Siglio in Italy, so that the positive obligation could not be considered in principle to be limited solely to cases of ill treatment by state agents. And it's interesting because that case is, um, I think it's 2003, uh, but it's taken a long time for uh, it to be clarified in uh, domestic law. But obviously we've got the authority now, the Supreme Court authority of D and a commissioner of police of the metropolis um, also often referred to as DSD, it's the War Boys case uh, brought by two victims of uh, the black taxi driver who um, claimed a breach of Article 3 on, on the basis of a failure to carry out a, a thorough investigation, uh, an effective investigation of Mr War Boys, such as to prevent him from carrying out future crimes. Uh, and the Secretary of State in that case tried to argue that criminal acts by private individuals cannot constitute a breach of Article 3. Uh, and the Met Police similarly sought to argue that given that the common law does not extend the duty of, of police to carry out uh, full and thorough investigations in, in that sense, and that's the authority of Hill and, and the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire, um, it would be undesirable to create the sort of conflict between the common law and public law if Article 3 could have that kind of broad reach. Um, but Lord Kerr was very firm in his judgment with which the majority of the court, of course, agreed, 
which was he just said, well, look at MC in Bulgaria. It's clear that the positive obligation to investigate is not confined to cases of, of ill treatment by state agents. Uh, and it does extend to a duty to carry out an investigation into a potential uh, breach of Article 3. He did also, of course, say that egregious and significant errors are required. So it's not a case that a simple uh, error or an isolated omission will give rise to an Article 3 claim. Uh, but, but it is true, and of course this is similar to the Article 2 obligation, that an investigation uh, of torture or inhuman treatment should be capable of leading to the identification and, and punishment of those responsible. Because, of course, it's an, it's an obligation of means, not results, but it must be capable of leading to resolution. Otherwise, um, it has no proper effect. Uh, now, obviously, in most cases, uh, victims of trafficking are also going to have opened them an Article 4 claim. Uh, and on that, I will pass you over to uh, Catherine, who's going to talk about that. If I can work out how to do this. Hello everybody, so I'm going to pick up from where Nicola um, left off by talking about how to establish a breach of Article 4, from which of course the right to just satisfaction, which will often include damages, will flow. Um, and I just want to say at the outset that I think this is a really interesting area because the parameters of Article 4 are well they remain uncertain and the case law is developing all the time um, and that means that there's real scope for developing the law proactively and positively in terms of um, using it to protect the rights of victims of trafficking um, and well, I mean, this is a theme that I'll come back to a bit as I um, go through my talk, but it seems to me that because there are various unincorporated conventions that have been used so effectively in recent years to help victims of trafficking and to develop an area of law which only a decade ago didn't really exist at all, the one well one result of that is that article 4 has been somewhat overlooked uh, and that is unfortunate because obviously article 4 through the mechanism of the human rights act is a really powerful tool um, in terms of domestic litigation um, in contrast with unincorporated associations um, so i begin just with that uh, introduction uh, and the importance of practitioners working together to develop uh, positively the case law in this area. I'll begin with a quick recap of the terms of Article 4 and really it's paragraphs 1 and 2 that we're interested in. Paragraph 1 of course a prohibition on slavery or servitude and paragraph 2 a prohibition on forced or compulsory labour. Um, just like uh, Nicola said in relation to Article 3, Article 4 is um, an, an absolute right, so it's unqualified. There's no question of assessing the proportionality of any interference. Um, and that was confirmed in a case called Stummer in Austria. Uh, and that case helpfully made clear that the um, exceptions, if you like, the caveats in Article 4.3 they don't affect the exercise of Article 4 rights. They're not justifications for certain interferences in some circumstances. Rather, they delimit the content of rights covered by Article 4.2. Um, another important and helpful point at the outset we know, um, thanks to the Rancev case, that trafficking, as defined in the relevant unincorporated conventions, 
falls within the treatment prohibited by Article 4. And there's no need to start thinking about whether it's Article 4.1 or Article 4.2. Trafficking, which meets that definition, is prohibited by Article 4. Um, so I'll move on now to the meat of my talk, which is about the positive obligations under Article 4. Because again, rather like Nicola was saying in relation to Article 3, realistically and fortunately we live in a world where the united kingdom is not itself going to be responsible for trafficking people what in practice these sorts of claims are concerned with are um, breaches by the state of its positive obligations under article 4 uh, and i've listed there the uh, three main elements of the positive obligations under Article 4, sometimes referred to as a trilogy. So number one, this is the obligation to have in place an appropriate legislative and administrative framework. Number two is the obligation to take operational measures to protect from treatment contrary to Article 4. And then number three, there's a procedural ob obligation inherent in Article 4 to investigate credible breaches. Um, and so you can see already very close similarity with indeed the way Article 3 works uh, and of course Article 2, although we're not talking about that today. So I'm going to take those three obligations in turn and unpick them a little bit starting then with this umbrella obligation number one. Um, Rantsev is still one of the most useful cases on this, even though it's quite old now. Um, Rantsev explained that this legislative and administrative framework that states need to have has to uh, be in pursuit of three aims. It needs to prevent trafficking, it needs to protect victims, and it needs to prohibit and punish trafficking. Uh, and importantly, it needs to be practical and effective. So it can't just be theoretical, it's got to actually work in practice. Um, and the court gave, the Strasbourg court gave various examples. You can see on the slide quite specific examples of things which the framework would have to cover so as to be compliant with Article 4. Um, now, I'm not going to dwell on this um, particular obligation because in practice, the vast majority of Human Rights Act damages claims are not going to concern flaws in the system itself. They'll more likely relate to a failure to comply with positive obligations in relation to treatment of a particular individual by the state. Um, but I thought it was worth saying, and people might be interested in this aspect and may have questions about it, um, it seems to me one of the difficulties of using Article 4 in this area is that the clearest and most stringent obligations in terms of a state's framework to combat trafficking flow from ECAT, not from Article 4. And what's more, rather unusually, although that's an unincorporated convention, we now know that a failure to with ECAT in the NRM, in the National Referral Mechanism context, context will be justiciable. Um, so that means that where a complaint is about flaws related to the NRM, Article 4 is not going to be the natural starting point. What you're going to do instead is just go straight to ECAT. Um, which, of course, is all very well when your complaint is about the NRM specifically, and there's really interesting and effective case law on this. But the result of that, in a way, the byproduct of um, ECAP being so successfully brought into challenges about the NRM is that 
Article 4 has been rather overlooked, and so it's not quite clear how Article 4 fits into all of this. Um, and so it seems to me that future challenges about the framework could benefit from giving more thought to Article 4, and indeed they will have to do that if the aspect of the framework being challenged is not within the scope, is not concerned directly with the NRN. If it's a different aspect of the framework, then um, you're going to have to go through Article 4, I would expect, because of course ECAT's not going to be directly effective. Um, and one example of Article 4 being used in this sort of way, it's, it's quite a crude example, but very effective nonetheless, is the CN against the UK case. And there, the issue, the problem with the framework was that um, at that point, the UK had not criminalised domestic servitude. Um, and so that was found to be a breach of Article 4. Uh, and indeed, that's one of the reasons we now have the Modern Slavery Act. So um, anyway, food for thought, um, scope for using Article 4 effectively in those sorts of challenges. Um, realistically, uh, the bread and butter of most Human Rights Act damages claims concerned with individual rights, um, individual victims of trafficking are more likely to be focused on, on the second and third branches or limbs of the positive obligations. So um, looking now then at the second limb, which is the op um, operational measures that a state needs to take. Um, you'll remember I said these are to protect victims of trafficking or potential victims of trafficking from treatment contrary to Article 4. So when is the duty triggered? Um, well, it's when the public authority, the, well, the state, but here we're going to be talking about the relevant public authority, is aware or ought to be aware that there's a credible suspicion somebody has suffered treatment or will suffer treatment contrary to Article 4. So clearly that's a pretty low threshold, it's only a credible suspicion. Um, what then has to be done to discharge the duty? Well, the public authority has to take measures within the scope of its powers to remove the person from the risk of treatment contrary to Article 4. So in practice, if they're in domestic servitude, they've got to be removed from that situation. Uh, they've got to be removed from their traffickers uh, um, and, uh, and put somewhere where they're not at risk anymore. Um, but it is worth just flagging that this is the final bullet point on the slide. The courts have stressed that the obligation does have to be interpreted and applied in a proportionate way um, so it can't, it's not supposed to be overly burdensome for public authorities and of course they can't be expected to absolutely eliminate all risk the point is that they've got to take appropriate measures in all of the circumstances so to give a couple of um, domestic examples where there was a breach of that obligation to take protective measures. The um, 000 case um, is actually really a case about the investigative duty, which I'll come on to, but quite helpfully, given that so many of these claims settle, and so it's quite difficult to um, get to the lay of the land and keep on top of them. The judgment describes the settled claim um, which was brought against the police and the local authority in that case. Uh, and it also states, helpfully, it was settled for £25,000 plus an, an apology. And that was in circumstances where the claimant was brought from Nigeria um, to the UK as a, as a teenage girl, she was 15, to work in domestic servitude for a family, where she was also um, really mistreated. Um, and the matter came to the attention of social services and a bit later came to the attention of the police. She actually attended the um, police station uh, at one point, but um, no, no action was taken. 
uh, and nothing was done to remove her from the situation of domestic servitude, which she then um, managed to escape herself um, a bit later on. Um, and so that it was in those circumstances that a claim um, settled um, for a not insignificant amount of money on the basis that the police and the local authority were in breach of their protective um, obligations towards this young woman. Uh, another um, useful example is the TDT case, which Rory mentioned. Um, and this concerned a young Vietnamese male who was found in the back of a lorry with 15 others. And he was detained in immigration detention. His um, solicitors tried to get him released on the basis that he appeared to be a victim of trafficking, but they stressed that safeguarding measures would have to be put in place first to protect him from the risk of re-trafficking. Um, but as it happened, unfortunately, he was just released before any safeguarding measures had been put in place uh, and he disappeared without trace. And in those circumstances, the court found a breach of Article 4 due to the failure to take steps to prevent re-trafficking, which, of course, is treatment contrary to Article 4. Um, the case is really, there's lots of really useful material in that case, so I'd recommend it if you don't know it already. Um, a couple of other useful points. Um, it, it's, there's a useful um, analysis of credible suspicion and how that should be approached. So in other words, when the duty is triggered um, and the court was satisfied that based on this young man's account of what had happened, the fact that the circumstances in which he was found, i.e. in the back of the lorry with other young Vietnamese men, in the context of broader evidence um, of a high incidence of trafficking among Vietnamese males, all of that was enough to show a credible suspicion that he was a victim of trafficking. Nothing else was needed that was more um, specific or particular than that. Um, and similarly, the court accepted that as a victim of trafficking, or sorry, as a suspected victim of trafficking, that was enough in itself to mean that he was at a real and Im imminent risk of re-trafficking on release. There was no need to identify anything really specific that related to this individual. If he was a suspected victim of trafficking, it followed from that that he was at risk of re-trafficking. Um, I said at the beginning that the outer uh, parameters of Article 4 um, are uncertain and I'm starting to edge closer to that territory now when I talk about the, if you like, the more the slightly willier elements of um, Article 4. Um, one of these is whether Article 4 imposes an obligation to identify a victim of trafficking. So as part of preventing uh, re-trafficking and um, trafficking, re-trafficking and protecting individuals from that kind of treatment, does that in turn mean that there's an obligation to identify? Um, and you can see I've listed the main cases on this here. Initially, um, it looked quite hopeful. Um, and the domestic court said obiter that they thought probably the duty to identify was part and parcel of the duty to investigate. Uh, but then the Court of Appeal said pretty clearly in the H case that there wasn't um, any duty to identify and that the only duty was a duty to investigate in procedural terms. Um, but we now have, well, there's a recent Strasbourg case, the J in Austria case, um, which draws much more on the international conventions. Uh, and there it's stated, although I, I have to say the analysis is, is not particularly great, but it does state that Article 4 includes a duty to identify a victim of trafficking. Um, so um, it would obviously be very helpful to have some domestic authority on this um, and hopefully we will have some soon. 
but it seems to me pretty clear in light of the Jay and Austria case that Article 4 does um, incorporate an obligation to identify. Um, and so logically, it seems to me at least, if there's been a failure to refer somebody to the NRM where they're a suspected victim of trafficking, that should then be a breach of Article 4. Um, as to whether there's an obligation to support under Article 4, again, we're getting into quite uncertain territory. Recent cases have summarised the positive obligations as being to prevent, protect, investigate and punish. Um, and obviously those objectives don't explicitly include an obligation to provide support to victims of trafficking. Um, but it seems to me that there's, well, there's a, there's a strong argument that providing support is a corollary of achieving those objectives. It's part and parcel of um, pursuing them. Um, and it also seems to me there's scope for using ECAT as a tool, uh, as an interpretative tool for, in, uh, for approaching Article 4, interpreting Article 4, as indeed Strasbourg has been doing more and more in the recent cases like Jay and Austria. Um, and so uh, the scope for bringing in uh, an obligation to support by reference to those other conventions. Um, uh, and indeed in Jay and Aust Austria, there is a reference to an obligation to support, um, although unfortunately there's very little, well, almost no analysis as to what exactly the scope of that obligation is. Um, uh, and uh, I think lots of us were hoping that the MS Pakistan case would clarify the matter, but actually the Supreme Court managed to resolve what was in dispute there without having to decide whether all the ECAT obligations were automatically incorporated into Article 4. Um, so anyway, watch this space. Uh, it's definitely a, an interesting and moving area. Uh, very briefly then, just to end, um, the duty to investigate, and really this mirrors um, Article 3, which is why I can be so brief. Um, where a public authority is aware, or should be aware, of a credible Article 4 breach, that then triggers the duty to investigate. And that's the case whether or not the victim themselves makes a complaint. As for the content of the duty, it's exactly the same as the investigative duty under Article 3. Um, so what Nicola said will apply here. Um, and we know there was a little bit more um, nuance and clarification from the MS Pakistan case. We know the investigation has to be independent and capable of leading to the identification and punishment of the individuals responsible. Um, so without further ado, I'll now pass you on to Adam, who's going to uh, talk to you about what happens once you've established your breach or breaches of Article 3 and or 4. Thanks very much, Catherine. I am now going to try to seamlessly share my screen in the hope that my slides come up. Great. I hope you can hear me. I hope you can see my slides. I'll get a WhatsApp message to tell me that you can't, if not. So now that we have heard about the kinds of Article 3 and Article 4 claims that can be brought on behalf of victims of trafficking, I'm going to cover some of the remedies that might be available <clears throat> under the Human Rights Act. Now, the key potential remedies are, of course, declarations and damages. If you establish a breach of one of the convention rights that Nicola and Catherine outlined, you'll get a declaration to that effect. I'm going to focus on when you might also be able to recover damages. But there are two overarching issues we're going to look at. One is uh, when a damage is recoverable as well as a declaration. The second one is if damages are recoverable, how do you go, out, how do you go about assessing them? And the key provision uh, and where the answer starts 
is Section 8 of the Human Rights Act. Now, happily, we don't need to look at much of the wording of Section 8. And that's because the House of Lords, in the case of Greenfield, described the four conditions that it contains before damages can be awarded. First, and pretty obviously, there has to be a finding of breach or prospective breach. The second one is that the court has to have the power to award damages. The third uh, is that the court has to be satisfied that an award of damages is necessary to afford just satisfaction for the claimant. The fourth is that the court has to consider a damages award to be just and appropriate. As you'll see, there's not too much of a distinction between three and four. Now, on this slide, I have included some of the wording of Section 8 and sub subsection 8.4. It's an important one for our purposes, and it's about the role of Strasbourg decisions when you are trying to make decisions on Human Rights Act damages. Now, the case that I mentioned just a minute ago, Greenfield, outlines how you should approach Section 8.4, and it makes three important points that you can see the first three bullet points there. First of all, the court isn't strictly bound by Strasbourg's principles, and that's interpreted in a broad way, basically how it approaches these cases, but it has to take them into account. The second one is that courts here shouldn't apply domestic scales of damages in human rights damages claims. So damages in tort, for example, the third is that the courts must therefore look to Strasbourg for guidance on damages awards. Now that all sounds fine, in practice it's difficult. That's because as anyone who has read Strasbourg decisions will know, it's often challenging to identify any principles or reasons for particular awards. Often you just get a paragraph right at the end with hardly any detail, hardly any reasons. Now, litigants have tried to push back on this, uh, this approach for Greenfield. But when the Supreme Court looked at it again in that other case I've got on the slide, Sternum, with a bit of additional nuance, it basically maintained the Greenfield approach. So now that we've got that, we're going to look at a couple of examples which are relevant to the kinds of claims DOTs might bring to see how this Greenfield approach works in practice. The first one is the O and Met Police case that Catherine just mentioned, um, sometimes called O, sometimes called OOO. Now, as Catherine said, this case involved young Nigerian women who were brought to the UK illegally. They were made to work for several years for no pay in households around London. They were subjected to physical and emotional abuse. Complaints were passed to the police. The police failed to investigate. The judge found that the Met Police had breached its investigative duty in Articles 3 and Articles 4. This case had come quite shortly after the Rancid one. Therefore, a breach had been established. The claimants argued that they should be awarded damages of between £7,500 and £10,000. They relied on the MC in Bulgaria case. Uh, I think Nicola mentioned that one. The judge awarded each one of them 5000 I've listed some of the relevant factors for the award on the slide. The first thing you can see is that there was fairly limited guidance from Strasbourg on the right level of award. Only reference to one case, the MT in Bulgaria one, and even that one, the judge distinguished it and gave these claimants a lower award. The second point that I've highlighted is that the damages were for distress and frustration as a result of the failure to investigate. Now, I should mentioned at this point, and this ties in with um, something Catherine said, for these claimants, the article for treatment, basically being in domestic servitude, had all come to an end by the time the judge was looking at these article three and four breaches. There was no psychiatric illness, there was no evidence of anything like PTSD or recognised condition. The compensation therefore covered a period that went from summer 2007 because it was at that point that the claimants were ready, willing and able to participate in a police investigation to December 2008, when the police made an unequivocal offer to investigate what they'd been saying about the trafficking that they'd been subjected to and the treatment they'd been subjected to. So each claimant gets 5,000 pounds in that case, as you can see on the 
low side of the scales. The next case, and the second example of the Greenfield approach, is DSD. And Nicola talked about this one, which went all the way up to the Supreme Court. I'm going to focus on the second of the two High Court judgments, uh, which was about quantum. So a reminder of the background, DSD and NDV had been sexually assaulted by John Warboys. They successfully brought an Article 3 claim against the Met Police for breaching the investigative duty. By the time the case was heard in the High Court, they had also brought a civil claim against Warboys, which was settled and for which they were paid some damages. They'd also received some compensation from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority. Now, Mr. Justice Green's judgment contains, his quantum judgment has quite a lot of useful material. It has a detailed review of Strasbourg awards in Article 3 cases, from which he draws seven key points. I've got them in this slide and going on to the next slide. On this slide, I want to highlight the first two. The first one is that evidence is important in these cases. When we're looking at non-pecuniary damage, which is generally physical or mental harm, in Strasbourg cases, there's often no expert evidence. Sometimes there's very little other evidence. If claimants experience distress, frustration, anxiety, that's often enough for an award. But those awards will be lower than if you have evidence of a recognized condition as the claimants had in this case. The second point I want to highlight here is that Strasbourg, when it is saying how much it's awarded, it records and seems to place some significance on how much has been asked for. So it may sometimes be that at least in Strasbourg, if you ask for more, you might get some more. On to the next slide, two more points uh, from Mr. Justice Green's seven key points in DSD. I want to highlight seven, which is obviously helpful having reviewed a load of Article 3 awards, the judge summarizes and sets out three ranges of awards that I've reproduced on the slides and that you can have a look at. If you want to see some more detail on them, I think it's worth having a look at paragraph 68 of the judgment, which in particular includes some of the non-exhaustive examples of aggravating factors in the highest range, which can lead to, award, to awards getting towards the higher end of that range. In the last bullet point on this slide, I've set out the awards that DSD and NBB received in the case. Obviously, they're really fact specific. They're still useful illustrations, I think. It's worth noting that both DSD and NBB uh, received a few thousand pounds as part of these awards for future treatment costs for uh, psychiatric treatment they were gonna need. And it's also important to be aware that these sums took into account the money that both of them had received from John Warboys, from the claim that they brought against him, and also from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority. It's not a mathematical set-off. It's not a case of just sub subtracting one from the other. They do all have to be taken into account. Now, DSD isn't an Article 4 case, but I think it's a useful, and it's not about trafficking, but I still think it's a useful and important one for trafficking. I've included a couple of extra points on this slide on how else, on, in, on the ways it might be used in the trafficking context. The first one in the top half of the slide is about the different effects of investigation failures. The DSD in that case, the assault by John, Wall, by John Warboys, would have taken place, the judge found, even if the police had carried out an effective investigation. So the damages that he awarded just reflected the effect of the police failures after the assault. On the other hand, for NBV, the assault wouldn't have taken place if there had been a proper investigation. War boys would have been arrested and he would have been prosecuted. So the damages that she got in part reflected the assault itself and in part reflected the police failures after the assault. The second uh, point I've highlighted about using DSD is about how to approach causation. Now, I'm not going to look at this in any detail. But the headline basically is that the Strasbourg approach to causation is a lot looser than the test that we apply here in tort law, which is generally the but-for test. In Strasbourg, the court tends to say that what you need to show is a causal link 
between the breach and whatever damage you're saying it caused. If you want to understand that in a bit more, bit more detail and see some illustrations of how it's applied, I think DSD is a useful one to use. Now in the second half of the slide, I've included uh, what I think it's fair to say are some very rough and ready examples of how these two cases and the investigative duty in particular might apply to different trafficking scenarios that you might come across in practice. Going through them very briefly, in example one, X is the BOT. There's a referral to police about the trafficking. Police breached the, invest the Article 4 investig investigative duty. X isn't only distressed by that lack of effective investigation, but he goes on to develop a psychiatric condition as a result of it. So the effect of the Article 4 breach in that case is a bit more significant than the O1, where there's no recognized psychiatric condition, probably a bit closer to the facts in DSD. Example two is a similar start. Police breach the Article 4 duty. X is distressed by what's happening, this lack of an effective investigation. Another person, Y, is then trafficked, and she wouldn't have been trafficked if there had been an effective investigation. She goes on to develop a psychiatric condition. Now, in that case, X has a claim for damages that's probably a bit closer to the O case. Y has a claim for damages that's probably a bit closer to the facts in NBV. Now, one of the challenges in bringing and assessing damages for an Article 4 claim is that the Strasbourg case law is much less developed than it is for Article 3. So you don't have uh, anything like that um, analysis that Mr. Justice Green does in DSD and lots of different Article 3 awards. On this slide, what I've done is include three examples of reasonably recent Strasbourg awards for Article 4 breaches. I don't propose to go through them in any, in any detail. They're all really fact specific. But I think they show a range of awards from 5,000 in the first one SM, going up to 40,000, 42,000 in all in the Radcliffe case, and the range of factual scenarios that you can encounter in Article 4 claims. Now, if you're considering these cases, if you're researching any others, I'd highlight two more points about Strasbourg awards that are worth bearing in mind. The first one is that the court covers 47 countries. The amount that it awards reflects the economic conditions to some extent in the relevant country. So awards tend to be higher in countries with higher cost of living and vice versa. Given the higher cost of living in the UK than Croatia, Greece, Cyprus or Russia, you'd expect if these, these cases involve the UK, the awards to be somewhat higher here. The second is that it's important to remember inflation. Generally, older awards should be adjusted upwards, and that's why in these cases I've included the dates next to the name of the case in the slides. Now, you may be pleased to hear I've only got two last topics to cover off. The first one is about a case called Al Saram. I think it's probably fair to say that in this little corner of the legal world, about assessing damages for human rights claims. You could probably describe this case as having shaken things up a bit. It was decided by the then Mr. Justice Leggett, who as of a couple of months ago became a Supreme Court judge. The case involved four uh, lead cases in a very big group litigation by Iraqi civilians who alleged that, that, that they'd been unlawfully imprisoned and ill-treated by the British Army in Iraq. They brought claims in tort, they failed for limitation reasons. Their claims for breach of articles three and five succeeded. Now, al Saran is a really long judgment. It's got lots of interesting material, a couple of controversial parts. There's one controversial element that I want to highlight and I've highlighted on the slide. And it's what the judge says about the relevance of domestic levels of damages and the approach to domestic damages in human rights claims. <clears throat> You'll hopefully remember that at the start, we briefly mentioned the case Greenfield, where the House of Lords said that courts shouldn't be applying domestic damages and they should look to Strasbourg for guidance. Now here, in this case, Mr. Justice Leggett basically says, right, it may be the case that you can't apply domestic damages 
but in certain cases they can be relevant and in certain cases you should take them into account. And he then goes a bit further than that and he says, for a certain kind of case, in fact, absent a good reason, HRA damages should be at the same level as the equivalent damages in tort. The kind of case he had in mind uh, is a case where the individual would in principle have a claim in tort arising out of the same conduct as the claim that's leading to uh, human rights damages. An easy example would be something like an individual is assaulted by a prison guard, seriously assaulted by a prison guard. In that kind of case, the individual might have claims in tort for things like assault, battery, trespass to the person, as well as possibly a claim for breach of Article 3. What Leggett is saying in this case is that the damages you get for the Article 3 breach shouldn't be any lower than the damages you get for the tort. Now, in the case itself, his approach meant that uh, while the tort claims had failed for limitation reasons, his starting point when he came to assess the human rights claims was what the claimants would have got in tort. And I've set out how he did that in the second half of this slide. Now, here, I've sketched uh, a few thoughts on the possibility of using this case in trafficking claims. You can have a look at the slides either now and later on if you'd like to. I want to highlight two of the reasons for caution that I've included on this slide. The first, I think, is that the Alsoran approach may be quite difficult to apply to the OTs. In Alsoran, the claimants had tortious claims against the state because they'd been mistreated and imprisoned by soldiers and other state agents. Where VOTs have been mistreated or imprisoned, it'll usually be by a non-state trafficker or similar person. So they might not have an equivalent parallel claim in tort against the state. The second reason for caution I want to highlight is that this slight complicated and obscure legal argument may not actually change the outcome all that much. Mr Justice Leggett accepted in that case a principle that human rights damages shouldn't be much higher or lower than the award that you get from Strasbourg because you had to cross-check them at the end. So in the end, you might have this big argument and get to a similar outcome uh, as you would if you didn't have a big argument. Right, I am nearly done. On to the last topic and the last two slides. Looking at whether or not we should get damages. Now, to some extent, I'm rewinding here to the first overarching issue to look at whether or not claims should recover damages at all. Now, I'm sure you'll all generally be familiar with the idea that in a human rights claim, it's not really about the compensation. It's about the principle often, and it's about stopping breaches of convention rights by public authorities. Now that is true to some extent, but there's a useful contrast that's made in the Asran case between two different kinds of cases. And I've got them on the second bullet point in this slide. The first kind of case is basically your classic JR. You're seeking to bring some unlawful de decision or action to an end, usually through a quashing or mandatory order as your remedy. The second kind of case, and the other end of the spectrum, is where you're not trying to bring anything to an end or to get some action to be taken. You're trying to get vindication for someone's convention rights having been breached. And the last bullet point, I've got an example of a recent case where this di distinction was used to reject a claim for damages where a regulation was found to breach the Human Rights Act. In this last slide, I've noted just a few thoughts on trying to apply this distinction to possible VOT claims. Now, the first example I've got is at the no damages, pure public end of the spectrum. You JR, a first responder, for unlawfully failing to refer your client to the NRM. What you want is for that decision to be quashed or for there to be a mandatory referral. The second is at the other end, the pure human rights damages end of the spectrum, no JR remedies. The obvious one is a case of ODA we talked about. There's also a possibility of a TDT case, what I call TDT round two that's been, um, TDT case I've been referred to. The claimant in that case, if he re-emerges, having been re-trafficked and he brings an article for damages claim 
against the Home Secretary for failure to protect him from re-trafficking. That would be for damages as a result of prevention breaches, but breaches that are in the past, not looking for a JR remedy. The third one is an example, I think somewhere in between those two, a case where your client uh, is seeking to challenge a failure to refer to the NRM, but that leads the client being re-trafficked for a time. So there's failure to protect, possibly. Client re-emerges, and they also want to bring a claim for damages for Article 4 breaches. Now, some of you might not agree with those examples. I'm sure you will have seen in practice all sorts of different examples of different situations, but hopefully that helps to illustrate the kinds of cases at the different end of the spectrum, and the kinds of cases where damages might be appropriate. And with that, I can see that Rory has disappeared. I've probably run over time. I'm going to come to the end of the talk. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Adam. I said at the start that I thought we'd done well within an hour and a half, and uh, that is a, an example of what you probably know already, which is never trust a time estimate from a barrister about how long they're going to talk for. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for their excellent talks. We actually only have about five minutes left. Um, good news, three bits of good news. First, um, Almost all of you who were there at the start are still there, and that's uh, hugely encouraging for us because when you're talking to a void, there's nothing more depressing than seeing the numbers tick down as you talk. Uh, second piece of good news, there are no questions, which when you put it together with the first piece of good news, I think means that the speakers have covered everything you could possibly want to ask. If you do think of something in the future, feel free to email us directly. Third piece of good news, if you're in London, the rain has stopped and the sun has come out. So before I let you all go to enjoy that sun, let me thank all of the speakers and thank the marketing team at 39 Essex who've done an excellent job of putting this all together. Thank you. Goodbye.